Video Collaboration Group 12, The War in the Pacific, The Battle of Guadalcanal. The Japanese had the initiative in the Pacific after the attack on Pearl Harbor. 1942 was the height of the Japanese Empire. In short order, they had conquered a series of islands, establishing a defensive perimeter that ranged from western Alaska to the Solomon Islands. In June 1942, the United States dealt the Japanese Navy a devastating blow. At the Battle of Midway, the United States sank four of Japan's six aircraft carriers. At least for the moment, Japanese naval power was shattered. The Americans had won their first major victory against Japan. The tide had turned, and the initiative in the Pacific belonged to the United States. Why was this important? It allowed them to take the offensive. In order to keep the initiative, the Americans set their sights on Guadalcanal. This attack had two other strategic benefits. It would protect the air and sea routes to Australia and New Zealand. Taking Guadalcanal would also allow the Allies to pierce Japan's defensive perimeter of islands. This would give them a base to launch attacks further into Japanese territory, inching them closer and closer to Japan itself. Guadalcanal is an island in the Solomon chain. The operation to go after it was originally called Operation Watchtower. The Marines had a better name for it, Operation Shoestring, because it was going to go ahead with very little preparation. Maps were scarce, as were charts of the tricky waters between the Solomon Islands. There were other issues as well. The troops were undertrained and inexperienced. Supplying the invasion and battle would require the Navy to anchor off the coast, sitting ducks for Japanese attack. But in the end, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, Admiral Ernest J. King, decided to take the risk. Operation Shoestring, the attack on Guadalcanal, was a go. The division planners for the Marines on Guadalcanal now, did not have good information regarding the terrain. With no maps and little training, the Marines approached the beaches of Guadalcanal. Awaiting them was the climate and geography with which they were totally unfamiliar. The first Marines under General Vandegrift were assigned the objective of capturing a grassy knoll four miles south of Wunga. It was believed this would be easy to access and capture. The Grassy Knoll, or Mount Austin, proved to be far more important as it overlooked the airfield and thus posed a considerable threat to it. It was estimated that 5,000 enemy troops would be defending the area surrounding the Grassy Knoll. The Marine planners decided to land far enough from the knoll and airstrip to allow time for landing and deployment of troops and for maneuver prior to the assault. The amphibious the assault on Guadalcanal was supported by heavy barrages from warships to screen the approaching Marines and by U.S. Army bombers attacking Japanese defenses. The Marine landing was accomplished without opposition. The first Marines began to move toward Mount Austin and quickly realized it would be nearly impossible to accomplish their objective. Aside from this realization and difficulty moving supplies inland, First day when as planned. General Vandegrift now made a change of plans wherein Mount Austin would no longer be taken. On August 8th, the Marines would take the airfield and establish a defensive perimeter along the Lunga River. Moving towards the objective, the 5th Marines bypassed most of the Japanese resistance on the island, which proved to be far less than anticipated. Some 11,000 Marines now held 
the tight defensive around the newly named Henderson Field after a naval aviator killed in the Battle of Midway. However, the Japanese had quickly prepared a counterattack to retake the island, which the Americans knew thanks to U.S. Navy cryptanalysis. Japanese naval aircraft began attacking transport and escort ships, and naval reinforcements arrived wherein the Battle of Savo Island took place and the U.S. Navy retreated. Believing American strength inland on Guadalcanal to be diminished, the Japanese 17th Army launched, launched an assault to retake the airfield early on August 21st. Known as the Battle of Tanaru or Alligator Creek, it resulted in American forces repelling the Japanese. The Cactus Air Force now operating out of Henderson Field, proved vital in confronting Japanese planes, warships, and transports. Another assault on Henderson took place September 13 to 14, in which 800 Marines, along with a small number of airborne troops, were attacked by 2,400 Japanese soldiers. The Americans again held off the Japanese in what became Became known as the Battle of Edson's Ridge. On October 24th to 25th, the Japanese again launched a massive assault that did not break through American defenses. Fighting continued through the new year as the Americans gradually overran Japanese positions. Six months after the initial landings, the Americans eliminated the last pocket of resistance and Guadalcanal was firmly in Allied hands. This section covers the major naval battles of Guadalcanal. As soon as the United States Marines had set foot on Guadalcanal, the Navy began engaging the Japanese Imperial Navy in a series of battles. This was located in an area of the New Georgia Sound called the Slot. Due to the over 111 ships and 1,450 planes that were lost in the area, the Slot became known as the Iron Bottom Sound. On the morning of August 9, 1942, a Japanese force pushed through the Allied forces that were guarding the Savo Sound. The Battle of Savo Island saw the first battleship losses, including the Australian heavy cruiser HMAS Canberra. The following day, the first Japanese cruiser was torpedoed and sunk. The Allied side lost over 1,000 sailors with another 700 wounded. 84 of those who were dead and 109 of those who had been wounded were from the HMAS Canberra. The next large action in the Iron Bottom Sound was that of the Battle of Cape Esperance. In October of 1942, the Japanese attempted to retake Henderson Field. On the night of October 11th, the United States intercepted a Japanese Navy unit similar in size. Both sides took damage and lost several ships after intense fighting. From here, we move into the decisive and last major naval battle of the Pacific War. The naval battle of Guadalcanal began on November 12th and consisted of a series of destructive air and sea engagements. On November 12th, the United States was bringing reinforcements to Guadalcanal. The Japanese, on a similar mission, began an air attack, and over the next few days, heavy fighting in the air and by sea occurred. On November 14th, Admiral William Halsey brought reinforcements to the United States. Both sides suffered heavy losses during this battle, but it would be the turning point for the Guadalcanal campaign as the Japanese were unable to strengthen their garrison on the island, which allowed the United States to move from a defensive to an offensive position in the campaign. Just a few weeks later, the Battle of Tassafaranga would become the final decisive battle of the Guadalcanal campaign. On November 30th, the United States Navy attempted to surprise and destroy the Japanese destroyers that had been sent to resupply and reinforce Japanese ground troops on Guadalcanal. After days of heavy fighting, the Japanese escaped but were unable to resupply their Guadalcanal troops.
This battle saw some of the first uses of a relatively new radar system. The November battles helped turn the tide of war to the Allies' favor. The Japanese Imperial Navy was never able to regain the same ground it had held prior to the Guadalcanal campaign. On February 9, 1943, the campaign officially ended. From here, the United States would begin its two-pronged island hopping campaign. <laughs> 